for this third episode where we are looking at understanding Bible prophecy. If you are new, uh, would you kindly consider giving uh, me a like and uh, subscribing to the channel? It's still quite a young channel. Uh, if you are a returning viewer, thank you for your patronage. Can we stay on this journey together? So, as promised, today we are going to be looking at the 400-year prophecy. You know, as believers, we are sometimes guilty of trying to help God. Remember the story of Uzzah? Israel was transporting the Ark of God on an ark drawn by oxen, which was in violation of God's commandment to have the ark borne by Levites on their shoulders. The Bible says that when the oxen stumbled, Uzzah reached out with his hand to steady the ark and was killed by God. As believers, we find scriptures that we do not understand, like this one, that we are going to be looking at very soon. And we try to force a meaning that is far removed from the intentions of the scriptures. We feel like we are helping God. We are trying to make the Bible agree. We force prophecies to be fulfilled when there are obvious discrepancies with the events of the past. So today I want us to look at uh, Genesis chapter 15 and verse 13. Genesis 15 verse 13. Uh, Genesis 15 verse 13. Alright. So, uh, we meet Abraham. He's been asked to make a sacrifice by God. And uh, this is uh, what God ends up saying to him. Uh, he says, And he said to Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve, I will judge. And afterward shall they come out with great substance. Um, in uh, verse 16 he says, But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Then I want us to jump and go to verse 18. In verse 18 he says, And in the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto your, unto your seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. People have said that... Uh, God was talking about the Egyptian slavery. But is everything really adding up? I want us to consider, to the, the, we'll first consider the phrase in the prophecy that says, in a land that is not theirs. In a land that is not theirs. So, which is uh, here... God says, and uh, he said unto Abram, Know for a surety your seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs. In a land that is not theirs. So when God says Israel will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, he is obviously contrasting it to Israel's own land. God knows Israel's land. And he knew what was not Israel's land. Because in verse 18, he says, In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. So, in the, in the prophecy, God tells Abraham the boundaries of Israel's land, from the river Nile to the river Euphrates. Now, when you look at the scriptures, the scriptures tell us exactly where Israel lived when they were in Egypt. They lived in Goshen. And where is Goshen? We find Goshen 
Uh, the Wikipedia says Goshen was located, if you're following my cursor, says Goshen was located around here. Around here. So where is the river Euphrates? We know the river Euphrates is to the east, this side. It is to the east, which is to the right-hand side of um, your screen. And the other boundary of Israel's land was this river here. So, was Israel dwelling within their land or outside of their land? Were they strangers within their land or were they strangers outside their land? This is part of the land that God gave to Israel. So Israel, while in Egypt, actually dwelt in their land of promise. So clearly, Goshen is within the confines of the land given to Israel by God. It is between the river Euphrates and the river Nile. Now, we'll consider the second uh, second evidence uh, which is the issue of the length of time that Israel was a slave in Egypt. We know how long Israel dwelt in Egypt because the scripture tells us in Exodus chapter 12 verse 40 Exodus 12 verse 40 says now the sojourning of, sorry, I didn't highlight that scripture, it's here. Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. So Israel dwelt in Egypt 430 years. This should not be confused with the time that they were actually in affliction or slavery. Because for most of the 430 years of dwelling in Egypt, Israel was a favored guest of Pharaoh. So, the prophecy does not say they will dwell in, in, in Egypt for 430 years. This prophecy says they will be afflicted for 430 years. Here. We go back to that scripture. We'll continue coming back to this scripture because it is very paramount and very foundational to understanding the things that we want to talk about. He says, And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs. We have discovered that while in Egypt, Israel was actually dwelling within the boundaries of their own land. So that can be Egypt. And shall save them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. The affliction is going to be for 400 years. Not the dwelling of Israel in Egypt. But the affliction, it has to be 400 years. So was Israel in affliction for 400 years? There are many studies that you can find on, in the internet um, that uh, contrast that. And uh, this is one of the studies. Um, the page is called Biblical Humanetics. Uh, and uh, there are some... Uh, Good debates that are going on here. It's uh, good to just familiarize yourself with it. Um, I'll put a link to this page uh, in the notes. But for me, I just want us to approach it in an easier way. Um, in um, Exodus chapter 1, verse 6, let's start there. Exodus chapter 1, verse 6. All right. The scripture says, And Joseph died, and all his brethren, and all that generation. That is, means the generation of Joseph and his brothers. Yeah. And Joseph died, and all his brethren, and all that generation. And the children of Israel were fruitful, and increased abundantly, and multiplied, and waxed exceeding mighty. And the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, 
The people of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply, and it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us, and so get them up out of the land. Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with the burdens, and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Python and Ramesses. Okay, so we realize that the affliction started when uh, Joseph and his brother and his and, and his brothers or the, his generation when they died. Among Joseph's generation was his brother Levi. Levi was about six years old. So sorry, six years older than Joseph. Le Levi was about six years older than Joseph. Now well, there is a, a description. Some people say about four years. Some people say about six years. But we'll go with uh, six years. So he was six years older than Joseph. And the Bible in Exodus chapter 6 verse 16 tells us exactly how long Levi lived for. Exodus 6 verse 16. The Bible says, And these are the names of the sons of Levi, according to their generations, Geshon, Kohath, Merari, and the years of the life of Levi were a hundred and thirty-seven years. So, Levi lived for one hundred and thirty-seven years. He lived for one hundred and thirty-seven years. Now, if you consider that Joseph arrived in Egypt at the age of 30. If Joseph arrived in Egypt at the age of 30, now that means, so let's add the seven years of the seven good years before the famine. That's 37 years. That means Joseph was 37 years at the end of the seven good years. And then it took another two years before his brothers came into Egypt as a result of the famine. The famine had been there for two years before Israel came to relo be re relocated to Egypt. So that means that brings the total number of years of Joseph to 39. That means Joseph was 39 years old when his brothers came to Egypt. If Joseph was 39 years old and he was separated by, by uh, six years from Levi, his brother, that would mean that Levi was um, about 40, 39 plus 6, about 45 years in age. Levi was about 45 years old when he arrived in Egypt. So if Levi was 45 years when he arrived and he died at the age of 137 years, that would mean that there is 92 years that uh, Levi spent in Egypt. Levi lived in Egypt for 92 years. Now, let's subtract 92 years from 430 years that we know was the total time that Israel dwelt in Egypt. That will bring us to um, about 338 that will bring us to about 338 years. So, that means Israel were slaves in Egypt for no more than 338 years. That's a far cry from the 400 years that the scriptures tell us Israel will be afflicted for. The scripture is clear. We will keep on coming back to this scripture, like I said. The scripture is clear. And, sorry, it says, And they shall afflict them for, so, sorry, they shall afflict them 400 years. So this scripture does not fit Israel. It does not, sorry, it doesn't fit Egypt. The Bible is not talking about the Egyptian slavery. 
We have to investigate and find out which slavery exactly the Bible is talking about. And to do that, we are going to look at Isaiah chapter 18. Try and do a search of, on the internet of the meaning of this scripture, Isaiah 18, verse 1, and you will realize just how many crazies are out there. There is only two teachers that have come up with a, a sound meaning of this scripture in its context. And um, that is Brother Dante Fotsen and Brother Jacoba from the End of the World Ministries. Both of them are available on YouTube. So, before, um, let's, let's just read verse 18, chapter, sorry, verse 1. He says, uh, War to the land shadowing with wings, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, that sendeth ambassadors by the sea, even in vessels of bulrushes upon the waters, saying, Go ye swift messengers to a nation scattered and peeled, to a people terrible from their beginning hitherto, a nation meted out and trodden down, whose land the rivers have spoiled. We'll stop there for a while, but we will go deep into all the verses, all the seven verses of this scripture, because they are very, very paramount. So, But we'll stop here for a while just to explore, to try and find out the land upon which God is pronouncing judgment who is this land? We need to locate the rivers of Ethiopia in order to do that. Because the Bible says, War to the land shadowing with wings, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. So, to find out which land God is talking about, we need to know what is the rivers of Ethiopia. You can do a search and uh, try searching for... Okay, maybe let's uh, look at uh, this word here. Rivers. According to the concordance, that's the number there, and uh, it's Nawa. It's pronounced Nawa. And it means a stream including the sea. So it also refers, it could either talk, mean uh, a channel of waters or a body of waters. Mainly that's what they are, they are saying. So it's a stream or a river or underground waters or streams. And uh, so it could mean a flood. So it could be a body of water or a channel of water. So when you go to do a search on the internet and search for Ethiopian river, you won't find anything. You won't find anything. If you say Ethiopian river, uh, if that's Ethiopia, but if you search for Ethiopian ocean, you come out come up with all these maps that show you that um, the Atlantic Ocean used to be called the Ethiopian Ocean. As you can see, this is one map, the Ethiopian Ocean. That's the Atlantic Ocean, all this body of water on the uh, western side of uh, Africa. It's called the Ethiopian Ocean. Uh, that's not very clear there. Um, and then we come here, there is this uh, black history. Okay, black history. They are saying the Atlantic Ocean was formerly called the Ethiopian Sea or Ethiopian Ocean. On maps from ancient times until the 19th century, today's southern half of the Atlantic Ocean in classical geographical works was known as the Ethiopian or Ethiopian Sea or Ethiopian Ocean. So they're saying, but why? Some people wonder why this body of water was named after a country that is located on the opposite eastern end of Africa, nowhere near its namesake body of water. Well, the term Ethiopian was linked to the fact that all of Africa, west and south of Egypt, was formerly known as Ethiopia. Obviously, the historic use of the term has become defunct nowadays. However, a prehistoric map, sorry, a historic map called the Accuratissima Totias Africa that was sketched by Johann Baptist uh, Hohmann and Frederick de Wert and published by Jacob von Sandrat in Nuremberg in 1702 
proves that the body of water continued to be referred to as the Ethiopian Ocean until the mid-19th century. After the name of the body of water was changed to Atlantic Ocean, botanist William Albert Satchel, 1864-1943, began using the name to refer to the sea around some islands near Antarctica. Okay, so that land is called the Ethiopian uh, sorry, that the, the 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 body of water that we are talking about here, when the Bible is saying war to the land shadowing with wings, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, is talking about a land which is beyond the Atlantic Ocean. And what land is beyond the Atlantic Ocean? What land is beyond the Atlantic Ocean? Uh, if you look at the world map, which I believe you can, you you will find that there is a there is South America, there is a United States of America, and there is also Canada. So which of those three is the Bible talking about? Let's continue reading. Let's continue reading in order to find the true meaning. Uh, he says that sendeth ambassadors by the sea even in vessels of bulrushes, upon the waters, saying, Go ye swift messengers, to a nation scattered and appealed to a people terrible from their beginning, hitherto a nation meted out and trodden down, whose land the rivers have spoiled. So, this nation is sending ambassadors or emissaries or envoys to Africa. There is no message uh, that is given to these uh, ambassadors except that they should go to a people. That should be very telling. They are sent to a people. Not with a message, not with anything. They are just sent to a people. Go and get the people. So we know that this is um, to take or to steal men for slaves. Because the message is simply go to a people. This singles out America from the three nations we identified as beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. We know America is the one nation that actually sent envoys, sent emissaries, sent ambassadors by sea to take slaves from Africa. We know that America started taking slaves from Africa in 1619 in what was known then as the transatlantic slave trade. Trans means across or beyond. Atlantic, as we have come to know, means the Ethiopian Ocean or Ethiopian rivers. So the transatlantic slave trade was literally named beyond the rivers of Ethiopia slave trade. Trans beyond Atlantic rivers of Ethiopia. So transatlantic slave trade was named exactly according to scripture beyond the rivers of Ethiopia slave trade. For those still in doubt that Isaiah 18 is talking about slave trade, let's go back to Genesis 15 verse 13. Genesis 15, verse 13, here. The scripture says that after 400 years, I will judge that nation. And we see that God is pronouncing judgment upon that nation which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, which we now know is America. And then he says, I will bring them back with great wealth. Here. They shall afflict them for 400 years. Also that nation whom they shall save will I judge. And afterward they shall come out with great substance. So God says he is going to bring them back with great wealth. And we know when he says I will bring them back with great wealth. Um, with great substance. He is telling us that there is going to be a reversal of the slavery 
those people are going to come back. So the slavery is going to be reversed and the people will come back from that land which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. They will have to come back. God tells us that afterward they come after afterward shall they come out with great substance. So we go back we go back to uh, Isaiah 18 Oh the way that this okay Isaiah 18 When you look at verse 7 in Isaiah 18 he says, in that time shall the present. He, say, he doesn't say a, eh, it's the, the present. What present is he talking about? Remember, Abraham was told by Abraham was told by God that your people shall come out with great substance. That is the present that the Bible is talking about in Isaiah 18. He says, In that time shall the present be brought unto the Lord of hosts of a people scattered and peeled, and from a people terrible from their beginning hitherto, a nation meted out and trodden underfoot, whose land the rivers have spoiled, to the place of the name of the Lord of hosts, Mount Zion. So we know that these are the same people that the slave traders were sent to, to come and take from Africa and take them to America in the transatlantic slave trade. Now the Bible is telling us that these same people shall come back with the present. And we know that the present is the sub great substance that God told us that his people shall come out with when he brings them back. So, in Genesis uh, 15 verse 13, we are told that afterward I will bring them back with great substance. And I want us to I, I want us to compare this with uh, Zephaniah. Zephaniah. Zephaniah here. Chapter 3. Alright. Zephaniah chapter 3 will begin from verse 10. Okay, the scripture says, from beyond the river of rivers of Ethiopia, my suppliant, that word my suppliant also means my worshippers. If you look at that, it means my worshippers. So, um, it says, from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshippers, even the daughter of my dispersed, shall bring mine offering. The Bible is now telling you exactly what those ambassadors were doing in Africa when they came across the Atlantic Ocean. They dispersed God's people. They dispersed God's people. So he says, from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my suppliants, even the daughter of my dispersed, shall bring mine offering. What offering are they bringing? They are bringing the great substance that we were told in Genesis chapter 15 that they will afterward come out with great substance. These are the former slaves coming back, and they are coming back with the offering of the Most High, the great substance that God promised they were going to bring. I hope that by now you can begin to see that uh, this Isaiah 18 is actually talking about the Atlantic slave trade, and that you can relate it now to um, Genesis chapter 15, where Abraham was told that his children were going to be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and they would be afflicted for 400 years. Now let's consider, slave trade started in 1619. The 400 years were up in 2019. 2019, that makes the 400 years. And so, if we are correct, we should be looking and saying, what is the next thing that should be happening? The next thing that should be happening, uh, according to Genesis chapter 15, verse um, 13 and 14, the Bible says it's judgment. 
its judgment upon that nation that afflicted God's people. And that nation that afflicted them will I judge. And in Isaiah 18, we are told judgment or calamity or war to America. War to America. Because it sent ambassadors by sea to take slaves in Africa. Here, in uh, Zephaniah 3, we are shown that these people are now coming back. And true to scripture, they are coming back with the offering of the Lord, the great substance that God promised they would. Now, let's confirm that Isaiah, uh, that this Zephaniah is actually talking about people returning from slavery. Here. You see in verse 19, he's saying, Behold, at that time, I will undo all that afflict thee, and I will save her that halteth, and gather her that was driven out, out of her land, forcibly by slavery. And I will get them praise and fame in every land where they have been put to shame. Who are the people that have been put to shame? It's not the Jews, the, the Jews of political Israel. People that are shamed every day. It is the black people of America. And that is specifically, and generally it is all black people. And he says, at that time will I bring you again. God promised. True to scripture, you don't need anybody to interpret and try and explain scripture for you. This scripture speaks for itself. It says, at that time will I bring you again, even in the time that I gather you. When is Israel brought back? At the time of the gathering. When I gather you, for I will make you a name and a praise among all people of the earth. When I turn back back your captivity before your eyes, saith the Lord. Do I need to say anything more? Now, we are going to uh, look further and uh, explore other things that support this, um, this understanding. Maybe let's end it here for today. Let's end it here for today. The video has become already much longer than uh, the previous ones. We will come back and uh, take this from here and look at um, other issues uh, that relate to this suffering. We'll explore why God actually sent Israel into slavery. That is the next thing that we'll be exploring in, the, in part four. We'll be looking at why Israel was sent into captivity in the very first place. So thank you for being with me. Uh, may I ask you to please consider subscribing to the channel if you have not yet. And uh, please give us a like if you enjoy what we are talking about here. And uh, please share the video. Thank you very much. May Jehovah be with you all. See you next week.